Uh, Ukraine already has, if I may say, the best army in Europe. I mean, they've already demonstrated that they're the best army. Not true of their Navy or Air Force yet, obviously, but their land force is already the best in Europe. And so it's not like they have to prove something else in terms of courage or, or capability. Uh, and then you'll hear people talk about, well, you know, they have to clean up corruption. Holy hell. I mean, there is there are levels of corruption in every country in Europe and in the United States and Canada. So I, I think, again, these are conditions that are out there. The only condition that really matters to most people, I think, where they would say, OK, we can do this, is they, they want the condition to be that Ukraine has defeated Russia. They're not at war. Um, and then, OK, yes, well, then we can accept Ukraine into the alliance and we're not automatically in a conflict. Of course, one of the priorities for every NATO summit is to maintain the unity of the alliance. That doesn't mean that we all agree with each other on everything. Obviously, we don't. But the unity of the alliance on the big issues is an essential part of the effective deterrent aspect of uh, our alliance. So that's they've managed to do that so far, although there are some... Uh, Let's, let's say some vulnerabilities have been exposed. I think the United States and Germany, for example, uh, appear a little bit isolated here uh, when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, there was, especially in, in recent weeks, a growing sense of the urgency and the importance of offering Ukraine membership in the alliance. And the United States and Germany seem to be the biggest obstacles to this, which uh, I have to say is disappointing to me. Mm. Uh, but a, a lot of other good things did did in fact take place. And you, if I may, just you mentioned Tur uh, Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkey did in fact drop their objection, uh, and I think this was in large part due to the U.S. efforts. But Hungary, I don't think, has dropped their objection yet. They've been talking about it. They will when Turkey does. But there, I have seen no official statement from Hungary yet. They've, and they will not be able to hide behind Turkey anymore. And just going back to Ukraine, if you would, for a moment, I mean, um, you know, the, 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 the general consensus seems to be that they would eventually become a, a member of NATO. The commitment was first made in 2008 at the Bucharest summit. Um, and yet they leave again empty handed uh, with President Zelensky being particularly vociferous on the matter. I mean, calling it absurd. Um, why are, do you think that uh, Germany and the US are showing this particular reluctance to, to move forward? Well, you know, I, I saw where Mr. Wallace uh, reminded everybody that uh, this is much better than Bucharest 2008, uh, that there's been a cultural shift, if you will, inside the alliance, that nobody disputes that Ukraine will be part of the alliance. So it's a matter of when, not if. So that's, that's better than this very open-ended kind of mushy thing that was... Uh, stated back in 2008 at the Bucharest. But that sounds open-ended and mushy as well, if you don't mind me saying. Well, I don't mind you saying it at all because I, I'm not happy with it. Uh, the, the sticking point is this uh, notion about conditions and, and uh, unwillingness to put a time on it. So that does, that does leave it open, as you say. And I think... Um, you know, and I've listened to various leaders, including my own president, talk about, well, we can't do it because as soon as they come in, you know, we'll be at war with Russia. But there is a big difference between an invitation and accession. So the alliance could issue the invitation to Ukraine, and then it may be two or three years before the accession. I mean, you know, Sweden has waited uh, over a year uh, for, we're, at least we're close to them being accessed. So I, I think that would have been a much stronger signal to invite them. And, and look, the reason President Zelensky calls it absurd, he's right. NATO was created to defend Europe against Russia or the Soviet Union at the time. Ukraine is actually defending Europe against Russia. Why, why are they not invited? Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. I mean, why do you think this uh, American in particular, uh, but German as well, re reluctance? Because obviously, as you've made very clear, the importance is to present a united front. This is a particularly um, difficult time, I suppose uh, you could say, in the Russia-Ukraine 
conflict because it feels like a sort of something that's being dragged out to its absolute nth degree with no idea when it's it's going to end. So some signal of greater unity that would push perhaps uh, things forward, um, and and particularly in the eyes of Putin to see that would seem yeah. this would seem to be the perfect timing and the perfect venue and the perfect gathering. It was I, it, it was the ideal time to do this. I mean, this was the stage and the time and the historical context for our elected leaders to demonstrate some uh, strategic bravery and uh, some vision about what do we want Europe to look like? How, you know, not just the uh, international rules-based order, but security and stability in Europe. And this was, is an opportunity to do that. And, and we'll, we're still gonna get there, but it, it did, should not have to take this long. I think there's two or three things that, um, caused my president to stop short. Number one, um, he has made it very clear that for him, the number one priority is preventing any sort of a nuclear escalation. Well, of course, none of us wants a nuclear escalation, but I think the administration has so grossly overestimated the possibility of a nuclear escalation so, so that the Kremlin, um, all they have to do is once a week trot out some knucklehead to say, you know, we might use a nuclear weapon if you do the following. Mm -hmm. Because they see that we we stop, we deter ourselves. So that's that's one reason. Um, the second reason, I think the the administration is concerned. They they don't know what to do if Russia does collapse, if Ukraine achieves catastrophic success and ejects Russia out of Ukraine back to the 1991 borders, including Crimea, which they should and they could if we would help. I think the administration is not certain what to do about that, and unfortunately. Most of the Russia so-called experts in the administration are the same ones who mishandled Russia during the Obama administration. Let me say, by the way, they're still a thousand times better than the um, idiocy of the Trump administration. But nonetheless, we don't we still don't understand how to deal with Russia. And then finally, I think China has something to do with this. I think China is communicating that they do not want to see a collapse of the Russian Federation because they want to make sure they have uninterrupted access to cheap gas. And I think President Xi would not want to see uh, a fellow autocrat collapse because it would re reveal the vulnerabilities of that kind of a system. And interestingly, one of the things that, that seems to be being repeated again now and was very much in the news when Russia first invaded Ukraine was this idea that, that Ukraine couldn't join until conditions were met. And I remember at the time of the war starting, uh, many of us trying to find out what these mysterious conditions were and never managing to get a straight answer. Now they've popped up again at Vilnius. What are the conditions that Ukraine has to meet that it hasn't yet met? Do you know? Yeah, this is a great question. And, and you go to Article 10 of the Washington Treaty, which is the treaty that established NATO, uh, very broad uh, three conditions for uh, membership. And none of them are, are, or excuse me, Ukraine is already meeting all three of them. So this constant, well, they have to do some more reforms. Okay, these are, these are not in the treaty. Uh, and to me, these are red herrings uh, that are designed to buy time to avoid uh, political leaders having to demonstrate the strategic bravery and vision that I'm, that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine already has, if I may say, the best army in Europe. I mean, they've already demonstrated that they're the best army. Not true of their Navy or Air Force yet, obviously, but their land force is already the best in Europe. And so it's not like they have to prove something else in terms of courage or, or capability. Uh, and then you'll hear people talk about, oh, you know, they have to clean up corruption. Holy hell. I mean, there is there are levels of corruption in every country in Europe and in the United States and Canada. So I, I think, again, these are conditions that are out there. The only condition that really matters to most people, I think, where they would say, okay, we can do this, is they, they want the condition to be that Ukraine has defeated Russia, they're not at war, um, and then, okay, yes, well, then we can accept Ukraine into the alliance, mm -hmm. and we're not automatically in a conflict. But of course, that wasn't a condition uh, and one of the conditions that they were referring to before the war started. So uh, it, it feels like we're sort of treading water somewhat on that, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. No, you're right.
Um, it's expected today that the uh, G7 nations are to put together and ratify a new security pact with Ukraine as a signal to Putin. Uh, what will that pact include and will it have the same power as, as a statement from NATO would have? Um, no, obviously it'll help, but there is no security guarantee other than NATO membership. Uh, short of that, we've got, we the collectively have got to figure out how can we um, help Ukraine defend itself and what can we do more broadly um, to ensure that Russia does not think it can continue to get away with what it's been doing. And I think that the G7 may be part of a broader, more comprehensive strategy about the greater Black Sea region that, that would include investment, uh, diplomatic efforts, as well as security cooperation. The whole time I was a commander of U.S. Army Europe from 2014 to 2017, the Black Sea region, we never had a strategy for the Black Sea region, we U.S. European Command, we the U.S. or NATO. And so it never competed very well for the very scarce U.S. Navy resources, for example. So we just didn't have much naval presence there. If you have a no kidding uh, comprehensive strategy, then it moves it up in priority. Then you have a better chance of getting the US Navy, the Royal Navy, the German Navy, for example, in the Black Sea region, even within the constraints of the Montreux Convention to demonstrate our commitment to security and stability there. Does, does Sweden joining NATO mean that we're going to perhaps see further deployments on NATO's eastern frontier? Does it strengthen up? Uh, what, what's the impact of it? So uh, assuming that uh, Hungary drops their objection and then both Turkey and Hungary, their parliaments um, will pass this, uh, the alliance gets better immediately when you add Sweden's, uh, not only their military capabilities, but their defense industry and a very, very resilient society and a strong liberal democratic government. So um, this, this will uh, really create a problem for the Russians in the Baltic Sea, obviously, with the uh, uh, near total dominance by NATO countries now all around the Baltic Sea. But this is important. It removes some of the op options uh, for the Russians there. And it also, I think, uh, indirectly strengthens NATO's eastern flank because our Baltic allies, such as Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, will feel more confident about who is, literally, who is behind them. And then, of course, you know, Finland and Sweden will be responsible for contributions to NATO uh, forward presence battle groups and, and high readiness forces as well. So getting quality Swedish officers in the various headquarters, you know, air, land and sea will also have a very positive effect. Um President Putin, we of course have been watching um, with interest what's been happening in Vilnius. Uh, what do you think his response will be and, and what do you think his impression will be of Western unity? I think that um, they will be, uh, I mean, Sweden joining the alliance is another on a long list of catastrophic strategic failures by the Kremlin. Uh, all of these things that have happened because of uh, Vladimir Putin's terrible miscalculation to think he could invade Ukraine uh, and that there'd be no consequences. So that's that's going to be very tough. And, and of course, inside the Kremlin right now, um, after in the aftermath of this uh, short-lived Wagner mutiny, uh, I think people are not sure who they can trust, both in the oligarchs and in the civilian leadership and in the military leadership. Clearly, loyalty means more than competence, the fact that Mr. Shoigu is still the defense minister. But um, I think they have to be uh, relieved or even maybe celebrating that the alliance still could not bring itself to say Ukraine is going to join. If President Biden would say Ukraine is going to win and we're going to make sure of it, and then number two, if my president would say Ukraine is going to be in the alliance and, and make it absolutely unmistakable, I think the Kremlin uh, would be feeling a little bit worse than they do now. 
Indeed, I mean, it's interesting. I spoke to Richard Chair, a former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander and probably a former colleague uh, of yours, who just just before this conference, he said, uh, I hope we're going to get more than a welcoming signal. We had that in Bucharest. The problems Ukraine faces stem from NATO. He, he went on to say, you know, we need to have not only a clear signal that they can join, but but also a route map on what the conditions should be and, and so on. So it seems like you're not a lone voice there in querying why there hasn't been a more emphatic acceptance? Well, General Sheriff um, was, in fact, uh, uh, my my boss when I was commander of NATO Allied Land Command, and I've I've always uh, respected his insights and have tried to plagiarize off of what he said and written <laughs> uh, over the years. So I'm happy to hear that we are aligned here, but uh, but not surprised. Yeah. Uh, just finally, then, uh, your take on on President Biden, you know, handing on cluster bombs to Ukraine. Um, I mean, in some ways, that would seem to inflame the situation. But but also, I mean, they're banned in, in so many countries. Um, I know that no weapon of war is a good weapon, if you will. But 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 nevertheless, these are particularly vile. So, um I have to say I'm I'm uneasy about the decision. You know, I I have worked over the past year as a senior advisor at Human Rights First. Uh, I've always been my whole army life been concerned about um, civilian casualties, collateral damage. Um, so I'm I'm uneasy about this decision. And the reasoning that was given by the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan at the Pentagon a few days ago, on the heels of the decision on the announcement. Sounded like, but as I listened to it, I thought, well, that's perfect reason to give the ATACMS, the 300 kilometer range, long range precision weapon. If that's the logic, why aren't we giving ATACMS instead of cluster munitions? But that goes back to my earlier point that the administration can't say that it wants Ukraine to win and it's worried about what might happen if Ukraine wins. So they make these incremental decisions. To the actual cluster munitions themselves, uh, there's the Ukrainians, of course, uh, are in desperate need of more ammunition. And because we, the collective, we in the West, waited so long to start producing more ammunition, we're, we're at a, a point now where um, even the Biden administration was willing to change their views and provide this artillery ammunition uh, to the Ukrainians. Ukraine, of course, has said that, look, we're, we're fighting for our survival. We're going to use these munitions inside our own country against an invading force. So we're going to be very discreet about where we employ them because of the, the potential damage with uh, unexploded bomblets. So I, I'm, I'm uneasy with the decision, but I, I can see all the logic uh, behind it. Just finally then, where do you think that this NATO summit now places us in terms of how the war continues to unfold? Uh, I think that nations uh, are unified in, in wanting to see Ukraine uh, become a, a member of the alliance. Uh, they recognize that there's even more urgency. I think there have been so many conversations and, and debates and discussions over the last months and, and last weeks and days that have elevated the understanding of what's going on to a whole new level. And so while I'm disappointed, as are the Ukrainians and many others, that we didn't get the invitation out this time, I think we're in a whole different level of, uh, of understanding of what has to be done. Uh, we're not going to be able to just walk away from all this. Um, you know, the United States just announced a package. The Germans have announced a package with more martyrs and uh, leopards and Patriot and ammunition. Uh, the French have just announced, you know, their long range weapon. So I'm hoping uh, that the Biden administration will finally say, OK, it's time we need to give these uh, attack arms and we also need to get serious about F-16s. Ben Hodges, a NATO senior mentor for logistics and retired U.S. Lieutenant General, thank you very much indeed for joining me and giving me your analysis of that NATO summit that's just concluding today.